Amen. Let's take our Bibles and open to Luke chapter 1, verse 76. Now, I know on the slide it said that this is a study of Luke chapter 2, but since it's my study, I guess if I want to go backward, I can. So, uh, uh, and I, I don't know if I can be this close to 76 through 79 of chapter 1 and not talk about it. It's a beautiful image, and the image is that of Jesus is compared to uh, a sunrise that appears in the middle of darkness and shines light uh, upon the world. It's a beautiful image, uh, and it uh, comes off from a prophecy uh, of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, filled with the Holy Spirit following the birth of his son. And uh, so we're going to look at it together this evening. You know, many people, uh, you hear people dreaming about a white Christmas, but uh, you almost um, never hear of anyone dreaming about a black Christmas. Uh, but that is exactly what London got on uh, Christmas Eve into Christmas in 1891. Uh, the city of London had already become famous uh, by that time for their pea supers. And these were events where the, the city would be, you know, it'd be a foggy, damp, no wind type situation, and, and the, the inhabitants of the city warmed their homes by burning coal. And so there was this, just circumstances would combine with steel air, damp air, coal burning chimneys, and it resulted in what came to be known as pea supers literally to where for hours, sometimes for days, you practically couldn't go out of your home. Well, in 1891, Christmas Eve, London experienced one of the worst pea supers that uh, they ever experienced. And the next morning on Christmas morning, the event was recorded in the New York Times. It was reported by the New York Times under the title, London's Christmas Fog. I'm quoting here, it says, The city was shrouded in darkness for three days. Many deaths from accidents caused by the fog. Holiday business almost entirely suspended. All traffic greatly impeded. As you read the article, you're, you're given more details of this desperate situation. Quoting again, Gas and electric lamps were kept burning, but so black and heavy was the fog that they only served to make the darkness visible. They only served to make the darkness visible. The weather is so thick that it is absolutely dangerous to attempt to go about in the streets. It is impossible to see more than a few inches in any direction. The saddest feature of the situation is the great loss of life that has been caused by persons losing their way and wandering into rivers. The article goes on to explain and to describe the victims who had already been recovered from the river. Now, to us, it's almost unimaginable, but it happened. Now, if you can imagine, after those individuals went through that terrible experience of the black Christmas, can you imagine after three, four days when the wind finally shifts? And that wind finally shifts, and that wind pushes that black fog out of the city. And for the first time in days, you're able to, in the evening, you're able to look to the west, and you're able to see the sun. And the next morning, you're able to look to the east, and you're able to see the rising sun. That'd fill you with joy, wouldn't it? That'd fill you with joy. The sunrise that appeared following the darkness. And if you back up 1,891 years about, the city is not London, instead it's Bethlehem. The darkness is not caused by fog, instead it is caused by sin. You're not in danger of drowning, but instead you are in danger of eternal judgment. But then the sun appears, S-O-N. And with that light comes relief, comes excitement comes joy, comes peace. Look at chapter 1, verses 76 through 79. Zechariah says to his son, being led by the Holy Spirit, he says, and you, child will be called prophet, and you, child, will be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, 
to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. I, I love those verses right there. And this evening, I'd like us to see together those verses describe for us the circumstance, the cure, and the calm provided on that first Christmas morning. The circumstance, the cure, and the calm provided on that first Christmas morning. So first, the, the, the circumstance of that first Christmas morning, we, we see it in verse 79. It speaks of to shine upon those, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To shine upon, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. This, this verse speaks, this verse describes, this verse illustrates a desperate situation. A desperate situation. It describes people who sit in a darkness and the shadow of death. Two images are, are given here. The, the, the darkness, they sit in darkness, and they sit in the shadow of death. Two separate images which are given to, to help the reader understand this desperate situation. First, it mentions that these individuals sit in darkness. They sit in darkness. It is a darkness that you can't walk out of. It's a darkness that you can't free yourself from. Your only hope of survival is that of rescue. Your only hope of survival is that of rescue. A couple of years ago, uh, we were at Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, and they, uh, you know, the guide, you know, we're with a group, and the guide takes you, uh, you, you walk down into Mammoth Cave about a, maybe a mile, and then you get to this one area, and the, and the guide says, everyone gather around, and everyone gathers around, and then he, he, the guide, he or she does this really crazy thing, and they turn the lights out. They flip a switch, and I, you know, I, I took my hand, and I stuck it right here, an inch from my hand, and you, you, you cannot see. That God walks off, I'm toast, all right? I can't free myself from that. The, 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 the darkness, who, they sat in the darkness. Probably a better illustration would be this. Two Port Authority police officers, John McLaughlin and William Jamino, were in the process of rescuing victims of the 9-11 terrorist attack when the South, the South Tower collapsed on top of them. Moments later, the North Tower collapsed on top of them. These men were trapped. They were injured. They were engulfed in darkness under 30 foot of debris. What do you do yourself when you find yourself in such a situation? You pray for rescue and you hope that it comes. There, there are some situations that you absolutely cannot free yourself from. There are some situations that if there is to be deliverance, it must come from the outside. And church, we must be reminded of this truth this evening, and we must help others understand that spiritually speaking, that's exactly where we are. We're under 30 feet of rubble, sitting in the darkness, and our only hope is rescue. Our, our only hope is, is mercy. Our only hope is someone from the outside who will come and pull us from that rubble. Jamino would be pulled from the rubble after 13 hours. Sergeant McLaughlin would be rescued after 21 hours. Rescue was their only hope. And humanity, apart from Christ, found itself sitting in darkness, trapped, injured, hopeless, in need of rescue. That's where you are without Christ. That's where I am without Christ, sitting in the darkness under the rubble, no hope, no chance, unless someone comes and rescues us. But ju just in case you missed the image, the Holy Spirit provides Zacharias with a second image, a worse image, if that can be possible, 
It describes us as sitting in the darkness, and then it describes us as sitting in the shadow of death. You see that there in verse 79? To shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. The shadow of death. The the image is striking. You're sitting on the ground, and death hovers over you, ready to fall upon you at any moment. The shadow of death stretches out over you. What is the death which is casting this terrifying shadow? This is speaking of much more than physical death. It is speaking of the second death, the the eternal death, which hovers over us due to our sin. Now, if we're talking about judgment and we're talking about the shadow of death, when I see the shadow of death, I want it to be like 15 miles over there, all right? But, But that's not the image. The, the image is, the, the circumstance is this. We're on the ground, and the shadow of eternal death is hovering over. It's upon us. It's upon us. That's the circumstance. The book of Revelation describes this second death. It says, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. He was thrown into this second death. And the Bible says on that first Christmas morning, if we could, if we could see ourselves as we really are, if we could understand circumstances as they really are, if we could understand the situation as it really is, it would be like sitting in a bunch of rubble under 30 feet of it in the darkness or sitting on the ground with death itself hovering over us. That's a terrible image. But that's the circumstance. That's the circumstance. It's very bleak. But it's critical that we are gripped, that we are moved by our desperation. It is critical that we are shocked by the fact that humanity sat in darkness, shocked by the fact that over us hovers the shadow of death. Why is that important? Why is that critical? Well, the answer to that is this. Who is the one who truly appreciates and receives with gratitude the hot meal? It is the hungry man. Who is the girl who truly appreciates and receives with gratitude the beautiful doll on Christmas morning? The girl who has no doll. Who is the one who truly appreciates and receives with gratitude the arrival of the Savior? The hopeless sinner who sits in darkness. To say it another way, we we, we cannot understand the bad news. We cannot understand the good news until we understand the bad news. The proclamation of the gospel must include this image. The the proclamation of the gospel must talk about sin. The proclamation of the gospel must talk about the consequences of of sin. You, you You can't appreciate the light until you understand you're in darkness. Years ago, we were... We were sitting in our, uh, we were living at Scipio at the time, and Tara had, had bought these metal signs, uh, and they had, the, the, they had hymns on them, hymns on them, and she had decorated the kitchen with three or four of these metal signs with hymns, and you know, I, 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 I know all these hymns. And so one of them had amazing grace on it. And uh, so she, she hung that in our kitchen, and it hung there for months. And I never read it. Why did I never read it? I know Amazing Grace. But one day, I'm, I'm sitting there eating my, I almost choked on my cereal. Because I, I'm reading that, I'm eating my cereal, and I'm reading that sign, and I almost choked. And I almost choked because they had changed Amazing Grace. And when I, this is what I read. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a one like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I'm see. What? <laughs> a one like me? No, it's a wretch like me. Yeah. We got to understand the bad news because we can't appreciate the light until we understand the darkness. We can't appreciate the life until we understand the shadow of death. Yeah. 
So here it speaks of, it speaks of the, the circumstance of that first Christmas morning and it speaks of uh, the darkness and it speaks of the shadow of death and we must grasp the problem before we can rejoice in the solution. But after this prophecy describes the circumstance of that first Christmas morning, it goes on to describe the cure provided on that first Christmas morning and that's verse 77. To give to his people the knowledge of salvation. To give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. That's good news. By the forgiveness of their sins. Why? Because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high has visited us. We sat in darkness, but then the sun came up. The baby Jesus laying in the, in the manger is the sunrise. The, the, the visit of the shepherds, the sunrise. The journey and the visit of the wise men, the sunrise. And so why does verse 78 compare the birth of Jesus to a sunrise? Well, the sunrise expels the darkness. And with its light reveals truth. And what does the arrival of Jesus reveal to those who had formerly sat in in darkness. What, what is the truth that is revealed? Well, in verse 77, it says that it is to give the sunrise, it is to give the people the knowledge of salvation. To give the people the knowledge of salvation. This is the gift. This is the cure revealed by the incarnation, the arrival of Jesus. He revealed how we can find deliverance where there had been only desperation. He revealed how we can find a light where there had been only dread. The rising of the sun, the appearance of Jesus gave to the people the knowledge of salvation, the knowledge of deliverance, the way to freedom, the source of healing. That's what happened on that. Christmas morning, to give to the people the knowledge of salvation. And friends, let's remind ourselves of this. If that knowledge had not been revealed to us, we never would have found it. No amount of groping around in the darkness gets us back to God. No amount of calling at the rubble gets us to freedom. The knowledge of salvation only came through the arrival of Jesus Christ through the arrival of Jesus Christ, by the forgiveness of their sins. This is impossible without the birth, life, and sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came into this world. He proclaimed the good news. He paid for the good news on the cross. And now he stands before us, asking us to admit our sin, repent of it, and believe in him as the solution for it. This is the greatest gift the world has ever known. Today, I hope we've all acknowledged our need, and I hope we've all accepted the gift. This gift was amazingly costly. Why, why did God give it to us? And that's verse 78. I love verse 78 as well. The cost of the gift was so high. Why did God provide it for us? It's verse 78. Because of the tender mercy of our God. Because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise on high will visit us. The tender mercy of our God. He did it because of his mercy. He did it because of his kindness. He did it because of his love, which he has for you, which he has for me. So here, in this prophecy, it speaks of the circumstances of that first Christmas morning. It speaks of the cure provided on that first Christmas morning, which is the forgiveness of our sins. And finally, it speaks of the calm provided on that first Christmas morning. Verse 79 again, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace, to guide our feet into the way of peace. You know, it's hard to catch a feather in the wind. Every time you get close to it, the, w the wind grabs it and swirls it out of our reach. I don't know if you've ever chased a, chased a feather in the wind, but I have, and I like feathers. But it's hard to catch a feather in the wind. And I think that kind of illustrates us sometimes with our lives. You know, it's, it's hard to grasp hold of peace in the midst of this chaotic world. 
It, it, it's hard to, to grasp a hold of peace in the midst of this chaotic world. I, I hope that after this last week, I, I hope that over this last week, you've, you've been able to spend time and be still and experience joy in the, in the midst of your family. And man, I hope today you feel like a million dollars, and I, I hope you're refreshed and ready to go for another week. But, but, but some of us are probably sitting out here thinking, where did this week go, and why am I so tired? Hard to find peace, hard to find rest. Every time you get close, circumstances grab it and swirl it out of our reach. And if we're honest this evening, many would admit that peace is a commodity that they have very little of. So why does the coming of Jesus guide our feet into peace? We looked at this last week, but Luke 2, 13 and 14 gives us the answer. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. You see, the follower of God can have peace because they know that God is pleased with them and is more than capable of overcoming any problem or difficulty that they may have in their life. So maybe this evening you don't have peace because you don't know God. He's not pleased with you this evening because your sins have alienated you from Him. Peace can be yours today through repentance. Maybe today you don't have peace because though you are a child of God, you know you have not been following Him as you should. This evening you should return to Him. Maybe this evening you don't know where you are, but you know you'd give anything for, the, for a peace that passes understanding that it speaks of in Philippians 4, 7. And friend, I would tell you that peace is found by following Jesus. It says that He came to guide our feet into the way of peace. He came to guide our feet into the way of peace. That is what Luke 176 through 79 teaches us concerning the circumstance, the cure, and the calm provided by that first Christmas morning. We're going to close in a word of prayer. I would, um, should have mentioned this this morning, uh, but um, many of you know that uh, our brother Dennis Adcock passed away on Friday. And uh, uh, Brother Dennis was um, uh, was in an accident last week and um, uh, passed away on Friday. So I uh, don't have the details of his service yet. I'm hoping to have those following the service this evening. So uh, um, we'll be we'll be posting that and and, and letting letting the church know uh, as soon as we know. So uh, be praying for the Adcock family, and we'll uh, we'll close this evening by uh, by having a word of prayer uh, for them. If you would bow with me. God, we thank you for um, uh, God. We thank you for that truth, uh, God. As we reflect upon it, uh, God, just a reminder that uh, the circumstances were bleak. God, you provided the cure, and God, because of that, we could have calm. Thank you, God. I pray that we reflect upon these truths as we we really enter into this season of, of Christmas, Father, as we. Um, God, as we reflect upon you, as we reflect upon what you have done, God, I pray that that would be the source of our joy. God, I do pray for, um, God, I, I just pray a prayer of thanks for Brother Dennis and his sweet spirit, and um, I pray for his family. I thank you that he is yours and he is with you. I pray for his daughters, that God, you would help them during this time. God, um, just bless them. Meet the needs in their life that only you can. We love you. We thank you for this evening you've given us. And it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. 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 We're dismissed.